Welcome back to another episode of The Grassroots Tennis Podcast, a platform created to entertain, educate, and grow the game of tennis at all levels. My friends call me Ship, but this show isn't about me. We will be bringing you interviews with coaches, community leaders, and players, along with updates about tennis happening around the world. Tennis is a culture, and we are all writing tennis history together. Today, I am here with Will Bloomberg. Will is a 10-time All-American while he played at North Carolina, uh, and he is currently playing on the ATP Doubles Tour with a career-high ranking of 74. For those people who follow doubles know that he played uh, with the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Rajiv Ram, uh, this past week. Uh, Will, welcome to the pod. Yeah, it's an absolute honor. Thanks for thanks for having me on. I don't know if it's an honor yet, but hopefully people <laughs> eventually find these and start binge watching all of them, and it, we get a little traction. But yeah. we we appreciate that. Uh, I want to start with a couple quick hitters. Uh, first of all, what's the racket of choice? I use a head prestige. Okay, uh, and string of choice. I also use head string, Sonic Pro, and FXP Mix. Okay, and what tension do you string at? Totally depends. This week is so hot in Atlanta. I was like 54, 56, but typically if it's like perfect conditions, I'm 49, 51. And do you weigh down your rackets? I just, not really. I make them even. Like okay. uh, sometimes they come a little different, so I just make sure they're even. Make sure that they're all the same. Okay. Yeah. All right. So obviously I think it's extremely interesting to get to pick your brain as someone who's really focused on the double side of things. Obviously, in college, you had a lot of single success as well. Um, but now that you are, you know, on the doubles tour, focused on doubles week in, week out, I feel like you have a different perspective than maybe people who are playing both or are specifically focused on their singles. Um, first of all, when's the last time you played singles? That's a good question. I'm maybe full I of good played, questions. I think I played Cleveland this year played now you played cleveland this year the challenger yeah okay but you're spending the majority of your time on doubles yes definitely but that was the last singles match i played i think i could be wrong but i think that was the last thing so would the goal be eventually if you could have enough challenger success in the events in between your doubles tournaments that you would play both or how would that work oh, for yeah. you? i'd love to yeah i mean i for me i like playing and competing in the highest level and for me right now it's playing the slams and playing doubles and and uh but ideally you know if i was playing and could play you know both it'd be it'd be awesome so eventually there's a chance that that's going to happen does that affect uh the way that you you plan your practice sessions not really i mean sometimes i go in waves like sometimes i'm out of shape and and i i don't think that i could compete in like a full singles you know tournament if i did well and sometimes i'm in really good shape and i'm like man i i could play no problem you know so I think to do it, it's just a different training and different focus, but it's not something I'm not used to, you know, my whole life I played singles. So. Okay. So what is probably the biggest event you've had the opportunity to play at singles so far? I played last year, then I qualified for the ATP 250 in singles. Okay. I, I played uh, this guy, Ram Kumar Ramanathan and then Noah Rubin. And then I lost to Benjamin Bonzi and, and that, which mm. was my first main draw at 250, which was awesome. Cause I felt good. Cause I, I earned it, uh, and qualified in. So that was, that was a great experience. I feel like there's just a level of confidence that comes with like, I think winning is contagious, but when, when you work your way through qualies and then you have a level of success, that's gotta feel a little more special than just getting a wild card. You know, there's something about that that's just cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, blue collar kind of way, but you feel like you earned it and, you know, you feel like you have your place somewhere. I mean, just, you know, prior to this, we were discussing, you know, being from a smaller town in a smaller area, right? It's kind of the same thing. Like if, if you break through and when this podcast breaks through, it, it means a little bit more as if you were, you know, sitting in a rooftop in New York City, like, you know, studio with a pot, you know, it's like you earned it, you earned your way and, and now you're here. So it kind of feels the same. It'd be different if I had played on the tour and I was already oh. working for tennis channel and I already had a huge following. And to be honestly, if that, if, if people don't ever listen to this, I, I, for anyone that it does eventually kind of stumble across these interviews, I, I just hope that they will be of value to them and that they'll enjoy them. So, so 
we're talking about practice right now. What do you feel like a quality practice session looks like? Like, what are the key components? What do you feel like is important for a practice session to be a quality? I think it varies for, for, for myself. I think, you know, the focus and intent has to be there. I think sometimes I'll go in waves. I think that's why college for, I'm such a big, you know, person. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm very for people going to college. I couldn't think of the right word there, but I, I, I think every day in college, there's like intent and practice. That's what I loved about for me, North Carolina and my relationship with trip and football. But for me now, that's what I try to find. You know, I try to find having intent and practice and not just being out there and hitting because a lot of guys are, are super talented, you know, and it's just like the margins are so small. Like we lost our match this, this tournament, 13, 11 and the third, we each won the same amount of points, you know? So it's like, where do you find those small margins? Well, maybe it's just 1% more focus and practice. So, you know, for me, I really want to focus on being intent, whether that's working on my volleys or whatever it is on that specific week, uh, or running around forehands, you know, hitting my backhands a little bit more, you know, harder and trusting a little more, whatever it is that I feel like I need to work on. But overall, overarching, I want really good intent on practice. I think that says a lot. I think that there are people that go out there and they just kind of hit balls. But even at the lowest level, I've talked to a lot of people about even in your warmups, having specific goals and specific targets, you know, where you're aiming or focusing on something in particular, you get a lot more, a lot more out of that. Uh, it brings a different level of intensity to everything that you're doing. So that makes total sense to me. You obviously were someone who, you know, you, you were obviously playing some pretty good junior tennis, you know, to be able to play at North Carolina and then obviously to have had the success that you did at the college level and, and then to transcend that into some success, being able to travel and play on the pro tour. What do you feel like top level junior tennis players should really be focused on? That's a good question. I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I think like, it's it's top level juniors and i think even throughout college i think if you want to play on tour like if you if that's your aspiration i don't think being nearsighted is the most beneficial thing for you and i'm what i mean by that is like if you win your match on that friday or you win your your junior match or you win your clay courts you know round of 16 it's not the end of the world you know i think it, becoming the person that you want to be and the player that you want to be and watching these guys. I mean, watching Alcaraz at 18, 19 was insane and watching these guys who are young, but watching the majority of the tour and yes, there are some young stars, but I don't know what the average age in the top hundred is, is 27 or 28 or whatever. Like you have this time, right? So you have the time to aspire to be the players that you want to be. And I think taking away, taking off a little bit of pressure of yourself at 16, 17, 18 would help a lot. You know, I watch a lot of matches and I watch, I went and watched this, this junior match like a few, a few months ago in Atlanta. And this kid was like throwing his racket and yelling and like throwing his racket at the wall, yelling at the referees. And I was like, I almost want to talk to this kid, you know, like it's okay. You know, you're like 16, you know, like you, you, you'll figure it out. If you want to play in college, like there are things that, that I watch a lot of kids do. And I think it just become, comes down to they care so much. They just don't know how to show it. Um, but I think taking a little bit of pressure off themselves would help a lot. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And obviously, having a bigger end goal, I think, really helps shape practices. I think goal setting and thinking long term is always better. It's nice to have those successes along the way. But you, of all people, I feel like you could speak to the fact that your juniors level to playing in college to playing on the pro tour what was demanded of you uh has always probably been slightly different could you maybe speak to you're someone who had a chance to play all the junior slams um and then obviously you played college tennis for five years so what do you feel like the biggest difference was between you know the competition level and kind of what your training looked like in the juniors versus what it looked like uh, when you were in college versus then again, what you had to do when you were adjusting to the pro tour. Sure. When I was a junior, so to give you like a little bit of backstory, when I was 14, I left school and I did online school, um, which was my eighth grade year. And so I was homeschooled from eighth grade. I repeated eighth grade. So I did eighth grade, eighth grade, ninth, 10th, 11th online. 
and then went back to school for my last year um and then went to college was there for a year and a half well so i started in january so that's one semester off I was there in a year and a half took another semester off semester on semester off so i took three semesters off so i, was, I played five seasons but i was only there um you know three and a half years really um anyways from as a junior i was training a lot and i was training originally when i left school like nine to five basically with a two-hour break like that's the most i ever trained in my whole life like 14 15 16 and uh i just found that for me that didn't really work and so when i went to college and towards the end of my junior career and talking about kind of intent to circle back to that, I just decided that it was best for me to have one practice that I was super locked in for. And whether that's, you know, two hours or whether that's three hours or whether that's whatever it is. And, and, and sometimes in college I would go in for, you know, they call them individuals. Some guys go, you know, a lot more than others. You know, they like each, everyone to come three times a week for me, whether that was, you know, a 30 minute session, 15 minute session, an hour session, whatever it was with trip, like come be really locked in and leave. Like don't linger. Don't, you know, I I've been fortunate to practice with a lot of pros. And one of them that I've been fortunate to practice with is the Bryans and Bob Bryan. Like he'll practice for two hours and he'll take two water breaks. Like he's not there to, to joke. He'll laugh and he's the nicest guy on the planet, but he's there to work. And I think that mindset for me, I got to train with him a little bit before I went to college. And I think that really helped me. Because when I was in college and I was practicing, I was practicing and I was locked in. And I'm a I'm a I'm a nice guy and and everything, but when I'm practicing, I'm just I'm in, you know. And we're practicing, and I like to compete and have fun. But I think I practice a lot as a junior, and then I would practice in college, like you know, I'd do a fitness session, you know, three times a week, and I'd practice every day, two hours, two and a half hours, and do a bike a lot of times after practice um, to keep the fitness. And then as a pro, when I was transitioning, I started to do. A little bit less because when you travel so much, you're tired. And my first year, I was a little bit a little bit lazy with the travel, but um, especially this year, I've been traveling a lot more. So when I've been home, it's been a little bit more maintenance. And if I have a long gap, then I'll I'll train a lot in the heat. That's a lot to take in, but I also think that that makes sense. The way that that's kind of changed, I feel like you have to put in some of those hours when you're young, like it, it, there's a level of effort that it takes to really transcend and kind of set yourself apart and get to a certain level. And then after that, it's like you said, put the time in, get in, get out, be very focused. But if, if you could go back and give advice to like your 13 year old self, what would it be? Yeah, it's, it's like an interesting one because I wouldn't really change anything. You know, I, I think that there were times when I struggled and I struggled with injuries, maybe from training too much or traveling too much, but I think it all kind of led me to where I am now and, and gave me like the mindset and perspective that I have now. I think I just tell myself to keep enjoying what I'm doing. Sometimes you get so caught up in the results and kind of what I was touching on earlier, especially at, you know, 14, 15, 16, when you're traveling with all these kids and everyone's trying to do the same thing. And then colleges start coming in the picture and you care about click courts and winter nationals and all this stuff, you know, like stop caring so much about the results so like day in and day out and more just enjoy what you're doing. Um, I think sometimes maybe I was even a menace, you know, to my parents and just be a little bit more appreciative of what, what's kind of going on. But, you know, then again, it's a kind of impossible to have that mindset at 14 and, and, or 15, you know, and be, you're kind of just in it. So, um, but probably just be, you know, don't take for granted what I'm doing. Absolutely. No, I, I think that that would be great advice. I think, I think there's a lot of people at all levels, even intermediate level juniors, um, from intermediate to advanced to like elite to world-class level juniors. It's so hard to not get caught up in what's your UTR. What are, what is your current ranking? What are the results? Not take a big loss for what feels like a big loss, super hard. Uh, I think that's a maturity thing. So I think that's, you know, good advice for anyone. Obviously, you at this point, I, I think that what a lot of juniors need to hear is eventually that UTR does not matter. Nobody cares. If you get to a certain level, people are not looking at that at all. Yeah, absolutely not. I no. also, I don't mean to cut in here, but I, I spoke with this this high school girl, you know, kind of recently, mm -hmm. who's like the nicest girl ever, and she was talking about how UTR and 
how a lot of kids will look at their UTR like every morning and it'll mm -hmm. change from morning to night. And, and I'm like, they almost should, you know, I think that what they did is, is actually pretty awesome and, and cool to find like a rating and a universal rating. And I think that's great. I think almost like there should be like a setting or some people should only be able to access it like once a month, like it'll right. just up like, and so kids don't, because I think a lot of kids, unfortunately, and parents, and like even I hit with a lot of parents here in Atlanta, uh, kids in Atlanta, and talk to their parents, and like, like, oh, we need to get their UTR higher, or we need to do this, or you know, and I'm like, it's kind of sad because a lot of kids just associate their self worth with their UTR, which is not how it should be, and it's almost like the product is so good, you know, it has nothing to do with UTR as a product. It's just like the amount of time that we as people in tennis are giving that and the value that we're giving it um is so so high that kids i think are associating so much with it which i think is great but it's the same t same thing like you know same in tennis like some guys maxim cressy right now is out of the top 100 but is he not a top 100 player probably not you know but if he associated that and only looked at that you know he'd only value himself at that which i bet he doesn't you know because he's you know i don't know what his career high is in the 30s or 40 you know he was so high enough to be seated at a slam yeah he was so he was up there kind of, you know up in the air that's a long rambling answer but that's how i feel i think that's that in general though the thought process around ratings and rankings uh especially at the highest level need to change but at the low level we have to change and educate parents and young people about not getting like you said completely wrapped up in that like someone like yourself your career high in singles is around 400 i think ish in that range yeah okay so people need to understand like if you were a basketball player, there are 450 guys on 15 man rosters in the NBA. If you were, uh, <laughs> if you were uh, worried about, you know, what your singles ranking is, you might be discouraged and you might not have got, you know, might've completely given up on singles, not have qualified into that event, whatever it might be. But as far as world talent, a professional tennis player is a professional tennis player. Like, you know, there's, there are guys ranked, you know, 500 in the world right now that are really good tennis players. But then if you're not ranked top 20 in the world right now, or even top five casuals talk about people who are world-class athletes, like they are essentially, I don't want to say scrubs, but you know, they, the, the narrative around it is not good. And so even at the highest level, changing that conversation and helping people to understand, like, if you're ranked in the top 500 in the world, you would be an NBA level talent in basketball. Now, our, our sport is not, um, with it being an individual sport, it's not made up that way, but it doesn't mean that those people aren't extremely talented. And like you're talking about Cressy, you know, for him to go out, out of the top 100, he's been as high as about 30 in the world. That dude's not changing anything. He just needs to get hot again and get some wins and he's going to, and he's going to be right back where he needs to be. He's, he's not a different player than he was when he was at 30 in the world. So definitely um, it is kind of sad how, how the juniors have wrapped their mind around it, but hopefully uh, they can, we can change the narrative and they uh, will focus more on development and maybe have more of a pro mindset of, you know, when you step on the court, you feel like you can compete with anyone um, or at least I would hope if you're playing at that level, you feel like you can. So mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask you, and this is kind of a hot take, you know, do you have anything that you're really passionate about in the game of tennis that you would like to see change or something about the way junior tennis, college tennis, or the pro tour, the way that it's currently uh, functioning that you would like to see change? That's tough, tough to think of on the spot. I'm sure that I, I'm sure that I do. I, uh, probably a lot. Of, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm new to professional tennis, but it's only my third year. So I'm still right. And I'm not, you know, it's, you know, like top 40 in the world where I'm playing week in and week out on the tour. And so not as much on tour. I mean, in college, maybe there are some, some things I probably will, but I'll, I'll think about it. And at the end, come back to that. And I'll give okay. you, I'll give you a much, much better answer. Okay. There, so. I'll, I'll hit you with an easier question. Okay. So let's say a player comes to you and they ask for advice. 
mm -hmm. right? Because I you've been training for a long time. You you've surely had moments where you felt like you plateaued and you had to change things up or maybe have a favorite drill, right? And they come to you and they say, Hey, you know, they can you help me give me some advice on what I should be working on? And let's say this player. The serve looks pretty good. Forehand, backhand looks good. Footwork looks pretty good. So there's no gaping hole in their game, right? They're uh, overall, they're pretty fundamentally sound. What advice would you give someone who's looking to take their game from good to great or great to excellent or excellent to elite or elite to work? Like essentially, what's the bread and butter? What would you tell them to work on? Whether it be, hey, you know what? This drill really helped me. And I saw major improvement after this, or, Hey, this is a favorite drill of mine. And I know this really, you know, this pushes my level when I'm doing a lot of this, like, do you have anything that you would, that you would, uh, you would tell them to work on, or maybe even just some advice for people who are trying to maybe find their next level? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for me there, there, it's not like I could directly, cause something that would work for me might not work for you or might not work for right. Joe or hair, whoever, you know? And uh, what I would say though, for two things that I would think about. One would probably be the serve. I think there are two things that are completely controlled by you. One would be the serve because nobody impacts you, right? It's just right. going out and doing these drills. They did this trip, trip, who was my college coach, showed me this drill in college where you basically play a game, but you would like step up to the service, service line, to the service line. You step, yeah. And you just like, you say, okay, I'm going to hit a first serve flat T. And if you hit it and it goes in and it's flat T and you're tough on yourself, not like body, right? Or, yeah. you know, flat T and it's in 15 love. If you miss, no problem. Love 15. Go to the next. Okay. I'm going to hit a hard kick wide. If you hit it and it's a second serve speed or it's a body or whatever, it doesn't count. 15 all, you know, and I think playing that game and you play two out of three, think of people worked on that more and more and more and started to become more deliberate with what they wanted to do on their serve i think that would help them a lot that's one two something i personally buy into a lot is the mental side of the game it's different for everybody not everybody buys into it which is totally fine i know some people that are top five in the world that couldn't care less about it i know some people that are top five in the world that could care about it you know so Whatever. For me, I buy into it and I think it's crucial. I see that a lot of people, whether they're amazing in college or in juniors or whatever, have horrible mindsets and horrible ways of dealing with, you know, adversity and dealing with difficult situations. And they'll never succeed if they if they can't get past it. I know people that are not that good at tennis that are able to do that, that are tremendously successful. So for me, I think that's no, almost the number one thing that I would recommend to people is to take that part of the game seriously. No, I think that's great advice. And I do think that anyone who tries to step up the mental side of their game, they're going to see improvements in their results. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I think obviously working on your, I don't want to say mental health, but just the way that you control your emotions and you channel that energy is huge. But then also, there's not a single person who's not going to improve by going out and working on their serve. I mean, it's it's such a game changer. And I think you're right. Uh, it frustrates me when I see people that go out to practice and then they're like, they hit, I don't know, they'll hit like 20 serves like in the last five minutes right before they leave and say, oh, yeah, I hit serves today. When in reality, that's what starts every single point. And it's the one thing they can control the most. And it can be a huge game changer. Not enough tennis players think of themselves as an elite pitcher who has to pitch a good ball game. The way that it, you're setting yourself up. If you pitch a good ball game, if you can, you know, you know, right here, I can win these points on my service game if I have the ability to truly jam my opponent, or I have the ability to win these points if my kick serves good enough to really get my opponent off the side of the court, or if I can even, you know, you have the ability to hit slice wide or slice body or or really truly hit your flat serve on the tee and have that control and placement um there's a lot of people that are playing casual tennis or trying to play college tennis that don't have that level of control so yeah i think that that would be awesome it's a little easier question could you tell us what your happiest tennis moment is that's a good question i probably have a a couple one of them being winning my first ATP title in doubles and having my family there. 
I mean, I never really thought that that would happen. And, you know, you always dream of that happening, whether I don't care that it was in doubles, it, you know, still happened. And to do that and have my whole family there, my grandparents, everyone was there was like crazy. Did that happen in Newport? And then the next year to do it again in Newport, I was like, what is going on? You know, like what simulation am I in? And uh, that was probably a really cool moment watching what, well, you know, one of my best friends clinch at Georgia, my freshman year, Bo was also one of the, the best tennis moments of my whole life too. Not even for like the match or just like the moment, you know, and watching like a, I don't know. It was like unbelievable to watch your friend do something like that. You know? So it was, those are, those are some of the tops tops for me. I think that people could actually take a lot from your answer there to know that you were the first person in the history of college tennis to be a 10 time all American, obviously with COVID it's kind of a unique situation, getting that extra year uh, and getting to do that, being an all American singles and doubles every year. And to hear you say, you know, I didn't, I wasn't sure I'd ever win an ATP tour title at any level. Some people, not that they need to have more realistic expectations, but I think it just speaks to the level you have to be at to do that and the amount of effort and work and sustained effort over time it takes to, to even have one of those accomplishments happen. Uh, yeah, I, just, I don't think anything's guaranteed, you know? I mean, I think, who knows? You could play amazing. You could. There are a lot of guys. I mean, what up until like last year, I don't think Felix had won an ATP title. You know, yeah. and I would say he's a much higher level than me. You know, like yeah. I, I, I don't think that these things are guaranteed. Some guys like win in their first try, and some guys it takes never. You know, some guys five thousand. Like it's, it's nothing's guaranteed. I think having the mindset of like just being appreciative for me, I'm just appreciative to be out there. I think that's this is like a small segue, but it is important in the in the world of podcasting and and in the world of discussions. I think that sometimes people are a little sensitive in today's universe. And what I mean by that is I think it's okay for people to have their opinions and, and to differ on opinions and disagree. And like, I feel like that's an important piece of, of sports and it's an important piece of discussions and it's an important piece of podcasting. I think in the college game, in the pro game with, you know, discussing what needs change, discussing people's opinions on singles, discussing people's opinions on doubles, discussing people's opinions on everything. Like, I think people, some people get so worked up when someone disagrees or like, it's okay. You know, like if somebody, like, let's say someone came on here, you interviewed and they're like, Oh my God, if I'm number one in the country and I don't win a tour event, like I'm going to go crazy. Cool. That's your opinion, you know? Right. And for me, like, I don't, I don't see it as that. And I don't, I think it's okay to disagree. And I think that's what's so amazing about it the opportunity that we all have, the platform that we have. I think that's why we discuss, right? If everyone agreed and everyone was on the same page, it'd be kind of boring. And I think the ability to have that discussion and to be okay with someone having a different opinion is kind of why it's fun to have these discussions um, and to move forward. And I think people need to disagree more, honestly. And I think people need to express their opinions and be okay with someone you know, disagreeing with them at any level of the game. I think the having the discussions of people having different opinions is what drives growth. I think if you can't have these discussions without people getting offended, then this game never gets to where we truly want it to be. As far as, you know, I'd love to see 400 guys at least consistently making a comfortable living playing tennis. Like we can, I don't know that we can say that right now by any means. And I think that if they change the way they structured things, we could make that happen. But then there's other people who are like, that's not our priority. Right. So really, um, which is totally great. That's yeah. fine. Like for me, I would like to see it too. Right. And, and, and I, in my own case, I'd love to make more money and I'd love to have this, but I also understand on the other spectrum, what drives really the growth of the game right now not that you know not what not so I, it to not be understanding and not you know i i think it's important for people sometimes to just take a deep breath and understand that it's okay if people have difference in opinions and i think it's okay to have these discussions and i think it's important too absolutely um here at the grassroots tennis pod we believe in giving people their flowers 
who is someone underappreciated in the tennis community? Wow, that's a good question. You know who I'm going to give their flat my flowers to? Who? Is Andrew Parker. I don't know if you've, you've gotten to come across Drew, but he runs. He's going to hate, hate, hate that I'm saying this. So I should clip he, this. This is the clip I should post. This is a clip. He's okay. in charge of, uh, of Carolina Tennis Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. He works for the for the program. He's an absolute staple for the program. He does everything for us. He he is in charge of the equipment. He's in charge of making the center right. He's in charge of absolutely anything and everything for Carolina Carolina tennis. It does not run without Drew, and he deserves all the flowers. He everybody loves him. He's behind the scenes. He's running Carolina tennis on Twitter. I think it's UNC Tennis on Instagram. I'm going to be wrong, and he's going to be pissed, but I know it's at Carolina Tennis on Twitter. Maybe at UNC Men's Tennis or something on Instagram. Follow him. Go check him out. He works his tail off, and he deserves all the flowers. It's those behind-the-scenes guys, those social media guys, that they're putting in crazy work, and people don't even realize it. So, obviously, I think that that's a, that's a great one, and hopefully he doesn't completely hate you for shouting him out, but – yeah. Uh, I'd say that's that's pretty good. Do you want to come back to your hot take? Did you think of anything? I mean, one thing I'd say is I think people should warm up less in college tennis. That's not that hot a take, but I can't believe that people warm up for an hour straight. I think that it would be fun to integrate playing with sometimes some deuce points on the tour. I know that that might be you know something that people would disagree with, but maybe even just like a test or sometimes playing with, I would never want to see a Wimbledon final on like a deuce point though. So maybe not, maybe in like a 250 level, just, just like one thing. I think some things that college tennis does is great. And I think it'd be cool to see on tour. Um, Yeah. I don't know. That's a tough one. There's definitely things that need to be changed. Um, I like what, you know, so far what the PTPA is doing. I think there needs to be a players union. I don't know if that's like a hot take or if that's just a, an average take because I think it yeah. needs to happen. But I think what those guys are trying to do and, you know, I'm not really, I mean, I'm in full support of it, but in my current situation, there's not much that I'm, you know, doing with them. I think hopefully the singles guys, you know, care about it and do it and, you know, whatever they're doing, I think is great. Cause I think if a players union was there in tennis, that would be amazing. Um, especially for the singles guys, try to get them, you know, to make as much money as possible. Cause I think there, there is money somewhere. Um, probably not as much as golf, but I think that those guys deserve to make more and, and should, um, and hopefully that trickles down all the way on the tour. And yeah, I think that would be my number one is just continuing to push the, for this union and players union and, and, you know, more power for the players. And yeah, so all those guys and that, that really, I mean, these guys in the top 30, 40, you know, they do so much for the game. So I hope that, uh, you know, they get really repaid for what they're, they're doing. Well, we are so glad uh, that you were able to join us today on the pod. My last question is who do you think needs to come on the grassroots tennis pod? Keep in mind, whoever you say you have to help us get this person because you have the connections, not us. I'm merely, you know, a passenger on this journey of picking people's brains. Who has a story we really need to hear or a, a brain we really need to pick? It could be a, 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 an active player, college player, junior player, community leader, or a coach. It's, who do you think that we need to talk to? Um, I think maybe Rinky. I don't know if you guys oh, have, have you tried. I have not, but that would be fun. I think Rinky, he's, you know, he has a lot. A lot, he'll have a lot to tell you. He, he's, you know, he obviously had a lot of success in the juniors, Grand Slam champion, indoor national champion. He's got a lot. I mean, he's he deserves a lot of flowers too for his work ethic. But hopefully, I'll let him save it uh, for when he comes on here. Yeah, I think that that would be great. Uh, well, 
I think that's it. So I'm going to let you get back to your day. For anyone listening to the Grassroots Tennis Pod, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, you can email us at grassrootstennispod at gmail.com. Uh, make sure if you enjoyed this interview today, you share it with someone that you know loves tennis. Uh, and then you can give us a follow on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. We are doing follow for follow. If you follow us, yes, we will follow you back. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Grassroots Tennis Pod and on Twitter at G Tennis Pod. We're not as active on there yet as we need to be but it's a one-man show we're trying will thank you so much thank you for your time today and after you win some big title today or you know soon we might have to we might have to check back in at some point Let's do it. all right sounds Thanks good so take much. care thank you Thank you.